Good morning and welcome to Ecclesia Baptist. We are delighted that you have chosen to worship with us this morning or this afternoon or this evening or sometime in the middle of the week. Whenever you are here, you are welcome and we are glad that you are with us. When we meet face to face, our children come forward and they bring our cross and our um, candle and the stole and they, they place the stole around my neck and light the candle and often they don't even catch the church on fire or anything. And um, we turn together, the children and I, we hold out our hands and say to you, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God. <laughs> Each week I've been trying to learn a little bit more about how to bring God's justice into the world, how to be more in tune to those who are marginalized. This week in, sorry, what I learned this week, I get, uh, I get this week's lesson from a friend of Ecclesia named uh, Jermaine Weaver, who is a dear friend of Ecclesia and a friend of, uh, dear friend of the Dotson family. And so Jermaine posted on Facebook this week and I, I just I wanted to share his words with you. Jermaine is a police, a retired police officer. I guess he's retired. Um, and at any way, right, he had been a a police officer for a long time, and uh, he shared this. So I'm just gonna read uh, Jermaine's words to you. He says this, I'm tired of reading 
these posts of naive people saying, if you don't do anything wrong, the cops won't bother you. I'm pro officer and I support law enforcement, Jermaine says. I truly believe there are way more good officers than bad and I stand by that. I'm also a black man. I also was an officer for 18 years. With that said, I've also been at the end of an officer's gun twice in my life. I've been pulled over and searched four times, have been pulled over and questioned several times. Every last incident unjustified. I've experienced racism while on duty backing up deputies, all while a supervisor ignored and pretended like he didn't hear it. I've been pulled over and questioned about transporting drugs while I was actually a member of Asheville's drug suppression unit while driving to the beach. I say all of this to say this. You have no idea what someone is going through and no idea what they are going, when they're going to hit that breaking point and let anger allow them to say enough is enough, right or wrong. If you've never experienced this, then you don't know, so stop acting like you do. I just had uh, such, I just appreciate this comment so much because, I mean, I'm kind of uh, convicted by it as well because there's so many times I think I act like the expert or think I'm the expert on things. And when you've had no experience in that, it, it is hard to really know what it is like that's when we turn to the voices of others who've experienced that. Jermaine is a, a devoted Christian and a good friend, and we appreciate his witness to us. So that's what I've learned this week. Today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 26, 1 through 8. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We come now to our time of prayers of the people. Our own Ecclesia family has had a lot going on, as I mentioned before the service began. And so I want us to remember each other in prayer, but also I just feel a heaviness in our nation. I've been studying the Psalms of Lament this week, and it's been such a appropriate study this week. Um, as more violence uh, runs through the country, more um, discord weaves into every conversation, and um, it feels heavy in this world right now. And I don't know about you, and I, I think I've said this every week, but it's hard for me to rem not be surprised when regular things happen, things like car accidents and heart attacks and cancer, because it feels like the big stuff is so big that it would snuff out all the small stuff. But in truth, we have all of those things as well. And so I invite you to bring your heavy heartedness to this time of worship to bring your burdens here. 
Remember that this time is the time we give to God. This time is the time we say, okay, I don't, I don't get it all. I don't understand it all. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't, God, I don't even know if you make sense. But I'm going to give you this time anyway. And I'm, I'm going to try to grow closer to you or something. But this time's not going to be about me. And so in order fully to live into that reality, it's so important that we take a moment to acknowledge that the world is heavy. Take a moment to unpack and, and lay all of those things down. And so as we turn to our prayers of the people, I invite you to unpack and to lay down as we pray together. Let us pray. Loving God. Oh, how heavy this world feels to us. Heavy with the weight of racism and injustice on our shoulders. Heavy with the weight of, of knowing that our police officers, our firefighters, our our public servants put themselves on the line for us every day, knowing that we don't know the full story. It still feels heavy. Our nation is in the midst of a divisive election and it feels so heavy. It feels so heavy that even as we try to, to lay it down before you, it, it holds on to us. And so we have to pull and pick to be able to just give it over to you. And even then, God, our hands linger thinking maybe there's, there's one more article we need to read, one more call we need to make, one more status we need to update. Pry our fingers loose of these heavy burdens, oh God. And that's not all. Our shoulders sag under the weight of COVID-19 and all the implications to businesses, to families, to students, to teachers. We, we hold tight to the worries of weather destruction due to hurricanes and floods and fires. And, and we hesitate to put this down before you, God, because we doubt and, and we're just not sure that you can handle this without our hands in it. And that's not all. Job insecurity, car accidents, inadequate health care, children growing up too soon or not soon enough, chronic pain, mental illness. It's so so heavy. Oh God, help us to lay it down. Remind us that you'll carry our burdens for us, that you'll keep them safe just for now. Let, let us let go just for now and turn our eyes to you. And remember that you carry our burdens so very well, just as you carried the cross. As we unpack, oh God, there are those names who come to mind, whose personal burdens weigh heaviest on us. And so we speak those names aloud to you now, asking, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Mm 
voice in Jane Earnhardt. Lynn Gordon. Cindy's dog and the vets taking care of her. John and Patty, Karen and Dave, and Nina. Decision makers for education systems across the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And now I ask you to say with me the Lord's Prayer, just as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Do you feel lighter? Have you unpacked a little bit anyway? Don't pick it up <laughs> yet. <laughs> Wait a little while anyway. because now it is time for the children's story. And this children's story may be the silliest story I have ever, ever read. It's by Sandra Boynton, if that tells you anything. Sandra Boynton often had very silly stories. This was perhaps my daughter Trellis's favorite. It is called Blue Hat, green hat, a very deep plot, as you can see. Blue hat, green hat, red hat, oops, can you see that? I don't know if you can see that or not, but the turkey is standing in the hat. Yeah, there you go. I'll hold it there so you can see. Red shirt, blue shirt, yellow shirt, oops, the turkey's wearing the shirt on his legs. It's not pants, silly turkey. Yellow pants, red pants, green pants, oops. Blue coat, oops. Red socks, oops. Where does he, I don't even know. Oh, he has on yellow socks, but they're on his hands or front, I don't know what you call them. Uh, feet, front feet, oops. Green shoes, yellow shoes, blue shoes, oops. Yellow hat, green shirt, blue pants, purple socks, red shoes, <gasps> oops, the end. Red hat, blue hat by Sandra Boynton. Now I bet you're wondering what is the theological significance of that silly book? Well, I'm gonna tell you. Humans are like turkeys. We often get it wrong. We forget to follow what we've been shown to do. And sometimes when we think we've got it all perfectly, completely, absolutely, no kidding, right? Whew, boy, that's when we really mess up. In today's text, Peter, who last week was riding high as just the hero of the story, this week, Peter makes a big oops. 
And so kids and adults, I want you to listen to the text today and see if you can figure out how Peter made a big oops, just like the turkey. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for helping us to be our best selves and for reminding us that we can never be our best selves without your guidance and your wisdom. Oh God, we ask that you would help us to remember that even when we make our biggest mistakes, you are still our biggest fan and you will love us no matter what. Amen. Today's gospel reading comes from Matthew. We will be in Matthew for two more weeks at least, um, maybe three, but I think just two. I think September 13th is the last week we'll be in Matthew. And as a, our tradition in, at Ecclesia, we invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. This is in respect for the words of Jesus, which we find in the Gospels. So whenever we read from Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John in the New Testament, we, we stand in honor of those words of Christ. So I invite you to stand as we read Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 28. Still finding the right place to put my Bible here. All right, now that everybody, everybody have time to get up? All right, good. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 21 through the end of the chapter. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of the Father, and when he will repay, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to and God. You may be seated. Thank you. 
and never be the same. Will you risk the hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? There are some movies that despite their genre and whether or not you are interested in that genre, you should see, in my opinion. For example, I don't think it matters whether or not you like historical fiction or historical movies based on true life. You still need to see Apollo 13 because it's a great movie. I don't think it matter, matters whether or not you like historical movies or football, you still need to see Remember the Titans for a lot of reasons, but that's a good movie. Doesn't matter if you think you like it or not, you need to see that movie. I feel that way about a lot of movies. Avatar is one that I feel like, whether you like science fiction or not, that's a profound movie, you ought to see it. Whether bad language bothers you or not, you need to see Gran Torino. And whether you like superhero Marvel comics movies or not, you need to see Black Panther. I loved that movie. And I don't even understand even like comic books and superhero business. But I loved that movie. So a couple of days ago when, or less than two days ago, we learned that King T'Challa, the star of the movie, the main character uh, played by Chadwick Boseman, 
the actor Chadwick Boseman had died. I was so sad by that news. I was so taken by the fact that this young, vibrant man was now gone. Chadwick Bowman, um, Bozeman began his life in South Carolina like a lot of good people do. He was raised there and wrote his first play when he was just 17 years old in high school. He wrote a play called Crossroads, I believe. And then he went on to Howard University and later to Oxford and became quite a prolific actor, if not a superstar, certainly an employed actor. He was raised in the church as a child. He sang in the church choir and was baptized and believed in his, relied on his faith throughout his life. Even as a young man prayed that one day he would be able to play the iconic role of the Black Panther. But then in 2016, Bozeman was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. And I don't know what other crosses he bore, but he had to pick that one up in 2016. He was 39 years old. Following that diagnosis, Bozeman's career took off. He made at six or seven and maybe more films following his diagnosis, including Black Panther. He won 10 awards after his diagnosis, including SAG Awards and MTV Awards. He got married, all while carrying the cross of colon cancer, which included countless surgeries and chemotherapy. Meanwhile, while he was winning awards and making movies and fighting cancer, he continued to lean into his faith, according to the family pastor. One of the things that he did was volunteer with theater programs as an advocate for theater and drama education, but he also visited children in cancer wards dressed in his Black Panther outfit. See, Bozeman was carrying the heaviest cross he would carry, and yet from the time that he hoisted that cross onto his shoulders until his untimely death, his career soared and he was unshackled in ways he had never been before as his fame rose, his star rose. See, he was carrying the cross of colon cancer but he was also experiencing great joy and glory in his own life. He continued to follow Christ, not because it was easy, but because it was right. And because somehow the Black Panther knew that following Christ meant you got to take up your cross. He never complained about it. He just took it up and kept following Christ. Well, once again today, the Apostle Peter figures into our text. And Peter, as I said to the children uh, three weeks ago, um, Peter was walking on water. But as I said to the children last week, he was praised and he was the hero of the story last week. Three weeks ago, walking on water, last week, He's talking to Jesus and confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus says in response, upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter means rock in Greek. Petra means rock. Petra like petrified. Or petroleum, which means liquid, oleo, from a rock. Petroleum. So Peter, Petra, the rock, comes to this week's text in the very next verse. And in this text, it's, it's very helpful for us to know Peter 
You remember Peter, right? Peter's impulsive. Peter's not known for his um, uh, thorough thinking of the, the end result of things before he acts. It helps us to know this when we read this text. It also helps if we know that a translation is just a translation of the original language. I usually read from the NRSV. That's the version that I have. That's the one I had when I went to divinity school and the one I, I use on a regular basis. But for clarification, I try every week to read the text in other translations. And this week, I found the CEB, the Contemporary English Bible, Common English, Common English Bible, to be the best um, translation from the Greek. Because, okay, when we read this translation in NRSV, we think that Peter comes up to Jesus and he says, oh, um, hold on a minute, Jesus, don't, don't say anything else. Can you come over here? I need to talk to you about something. Hey, listen, don't say that about yourself. We got you, man. You're cool. Don't you worry. We got you. It's okay. And then from this text, we think that Jesus goes, ah, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're horrible. You're a horrible person. That's not really the way it went down. First of all, in the CEB, it says this, then Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him began to correct him. So there's three things he did. He took hold of him, he scolded him, and then he corrected him. So in the Greek, the word has a stronger meaning. It means, it means scolding, reprimanding, um, admonishing. It, it shows that Peter stepped out of place and was not acting in the best interest of the ministry of Jesus Christ. See, I don't know about you, but I always kind of felt sorry for Peter. I was like, well, dang, you know, come on, Jesus, Peter was just being thoughtful. He was just taking care of you. He didn't want to see you get hurt. That's not exactly what happened when we look at it a little more closely, because Peter steps out of line. And sometimes the reaction is part of the lesson. Sometimes the, the tone of voice, the words that we choose are part of the lesson in the moment. You see, Peter stepped so far out of line from where he was supposed to be, from where Jesus knew he could be and should be, that Jesus reacted sharply. The word Satan in the group, Greek, Satan, I actually guess it's Hebrew, um, trans, transliterated into the Greek, is means accuser. And so Jesus says, get behind me, you accuser. Accuser? Oh, whoa, Jesus, what? What are you, what, what is Jesus, what is Peter taking, accusing you of? That doesn't even make any sense. Well, Peter's saying, oh, come on, Jesus, you could take it easy. You don't have to go through that. And Jesus is saying, you know, no, 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 no. You just said I'm the Messiah. How can you accuse me of being someone I'm not? If I'm the Messiah, this is the road that I need to travel. So Jesus says to him, get behind me, you accuser. And then in the CEB, it says this, you are a stone that could make me stumble. For you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. I love that little play on words. Last week, Peter was Petra, the rock. This week, Peter's a stumbling stone. Um, the, the word that is used in the Greek is the word from which we get the word scandal. Scandaleon, I think is how you pronounce that word. So Jesus says to Peter, you're a scandal. You're making me stumble. You're a rock. You're a stone that's in my shoe and in my way. And I think that at that point, I think Peter moves back in line. I think at that point, Peter responds because if Peter is impulsive on the one hand, he's impulsive on the other. 
And so I think Peter went, oh, you're right. Golly, I forgot again. I really do. I think that's what Peter did. I don't think Peter took offense because I don't think that was Peter's nature. I think Peter just went, oh, you're, oh man, I did it again. I'm sorry, Jesus, you're right. I need to be behind you because you just said for me to follow you. And I stepped out of line. Thank you, Jesus, for that correction. And then Jesus turns and he says something else. He says, um, look, guys, if you want to follow me, then you're going to have to say no to you. And you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. And then he says this thing that doesn't make any sense to our ears. He says, all who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me will find them. And I just think the disciples went, okay, wait a minute. Can you say that one more time? I don't, what? And, and then I think they probably talked to one another and said something like, did he say, he was talking about, he said something about a cross. And a cross, that means crucifixion. Why would Jesus be talking about crucifixion? See, they didn't know this yet, right? Why would Jesus be talking about crucifixion? That's Roman stuff. I don't, he didn't mean that. That's not what he meant. He must have meant something else. What does he mean, cross? That doesn't make any sense. And then what is this about losing and finding and finding and losing? This doesn't make any sense. And then I think somebody said, no, I, I think when Jesus said cross, he meant cross. I think when Jesus said cross, he was talking about the Roman crucifixion. Dr. James Howell wrote a blog this week that I read, and he was talking about how in this text, what the disciples hear is, if you want to follow me, plan on going to your death with me. He says this, he says, taking up your cross may sound to us like bearing your burdens, like colon cancer or any other burden that we have. But to the early hearers, to the first hearers, they would have thought, he means we're on death row. We're walking that last mile towards our execution. We got to really think about this if we really want to follow Jesus. Jesus is talking about being stripped of our belongings and our dignity and our and, and our, all of our own rights just to follow Jesus. And I'm gonna tell you what, this would not set up well with Americans today because we are very serious about our rights, especially when we're in kindergarten. We have a really strong sense of what is fair and what is right when we're in kindergarten and some of us never grew up. And we forget that uh, we, we are, belong to a different kingdom a kingdom that says, no, 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 no. You need to align yourselves with those at the very bottom of the social ladder. Theologian N.T. Wright wrote this book called Simply Christian. I highly recommend it. It's a very easy to me, and I think it's a very readable uh, book. So put that on your uh, reading list. N.T. Wright, or anything by N.T. Wright, Simply Christian is a great book. And he starts this discussion on Christianity with a discussion on the Christian and justice. And he discusses whether or not, why the Christian should be concerned with justice. And he says this, he said, Jesus, when he lived his life on earth, was sorrowing with the world, the way it was, the world of violence and injustice and tragedy, which he and the people he met knew so well. From the very beginning, he says, 2,000 years ago, the followers of Jesus have always maintained that Jesus Christ took the tears of the world. That means your tears and my tears of the world and made them his own carrying them all the way to his cruel and unjust death to carry out God's rescue operation. 
and that he took the joy of the world and brought to it new birth as Jesus rose from the dead and thereby launched God's new creation. He says, Christian faith endorses the passion for justice, which every human being knows, the longing to see things put to right, just as Jesus longed to see things put to right. It, the Christian faith, according to N.T. Wright, claims that in Jesus, God himself has shared this passion for justice and put it into effect so that in the end, all tears may be dried and the world will be filled with justice and glory. See, if God has a passion for justice, we should too. And that is why Jesus says, take up your cross. That is why Jesus says, align yourself with those who are oppressed. Because Jesus has a passion for justice. We should too. I think it was in one of the first conversations I had with Stan Dotson after I started at this church. It was very early on because we were still meeting at McDonald's for breakfast and Sunday school. And so this was when we were still at the real estate office. And we were talking about movies and I was of course saying things like everyone should see movies like Apollo 13 and Remember the Titans and, he, and Gran Torino. And he said, everyone should see the movie Sling Blade. I mean, oh, I've never heard of Sling Blade. Who's in it? And he began to tell me, and then he said, I don't know, Aline. I know you don't like language, so you probably won't like it. And let me tell you, he was not kidding. Although I think the language in this one may be even less offensive than the, the language in Gran Torino. Just because I recommend a movie does not mean it's a children's film. And that is the same here. Because finally this past week, I got around to watching the movie that Stan had suggested Sling Blade. Sling Blade is written by Billy Bob Thornton and he plays the main role, Carl. Um, he, it really is him, though if you look at the movie, you may wonder if that really is Billy Bob Thornton because he looks very different. But he plays this character, Carl, who has been in a um, mental, uh, a criminal men's mental institution for 25 years on the when the movie begins and we learn pretty quickly that he is in there because he killed his mother and her very special friend and um they we hear that very early on right before we learn that even though he killed them brutally he is going to be released into the world we learned later that that brutal murder occurred when Carl was 12 years old. And that prior to that, he had been kept locked in a shed in the back of their property. We learned that Carl's life before going into the institution was not good. And that even after um, getting out, it was confusing for Carl because he had never lived in the world before. Not really. Well, he finds his way and he meets a boy named Frank. Frank is a dear boy who's, who's charming and fun. And he takes up a liking for Carl and Carl's sweet innocence, despite Carl's past. Frank introduces Carl to his mom and, and her boyfriend who Carl quickly understands is a toxic and dangerous man. The relationships grows and Carl begins to feel that he finally has a family where he is loved and cared for, where he has a little brother and a big sister. But he also realizes that their lives are in very real danger because of the boyfriend in the picture named Doyle, played by Dwight Yoakam. And so at the height of the toxicity, when it becomes evident to Carl and to the viewers that this isn't gonna get any better, Carl says to Linda, Frank's mother, I wanna get baptized. Do you know a preacher? 
she says, well, tomorrow's Sunday. We get you baptized tomorrow. And so Carl goes with his new family and goes into the river and the preacher puts his arms around him and he says, you're a child of God and you are saved by grace. And he dips him into the water and he declares that he is dead to sin and he lifts him up from the water and declares that he is now free from sin in Christ. Carl walks out of the water and runs a few errands that he has to run before the end of the day. Make sure that Linda's best friend is going to have her over for the night and that that Frank, the little boy, is going to spend the night with that same friend. And then, then he proceeds to bring about justice for his new family. When the movie ends, Carl's back in the institution again. Linda and Frank, well, they're free. They have a life they never could have had without the gift that Carl gave them. And somehow Carl is free too. Because you see, he followed Christ. And what he did, I'll let you decide if that was the right thing or not. But he knew that in Christ, he was a new creation. And for the first time in his life, he knew that he could carry the cross that God had called him to carry because he was loved. You see, Carl had learned to read in prison and he'd read the Bible from cover to cover. It took him four years, he said, and he said he didn't agree with everything in there and it didn't all make sense. But he believed enough of it and he understood enough of it to know that it's not always easy and that if you really want to follow Christ, it's going to be hard, but it will be the kind of freedom that you could never experience in any other way, a freedom cloaked in love and mercy and grace. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we confess that we don't know your ways. We confess that too often we get caught up in human thoughts. And we really, really want our way to be your way. Help us to know that your way offers immeasurable peace, immeasurable hope, and unending love. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You have heard the word of God sung. You've heard the word of God read and you've heard the word of God proclaimed. Maybe you feel called to respond to that word in some way. I hope you'll take the time during this next song to consider how God would have you to respond to the word today. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old
despised by the world A wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left His glory above To bear it to the dark Calvary So I'll cherish To the old rugged cross it sounds so pretty in this poetic sense. Help us to remember that when we cling to the old rugged cross, we'll be touching those whose life Jesus aligned himself with, those who were considered the least of these. And as we do so, let us remember, church, that you are loved. No, and there is nothing you can do about it. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week.